Welcome to Entrepreneurs the Playbook. I'm David Melter at the greatest stadium ever created on earth. It's amazing what $5.5 billion will buy you. If you're curious what a billion dollar screen looks like, we'll turn the camera and show you. But speaking of a billion dollars, I got a man who has a billion dollar story. He took me to another level. I've probably done the most interviews of almost anyone on earth, over 4,000 interviews. And uh, my friend here, Kevin Hines, blew me out of the water uh, with his story. But more importantly than his story, what he's doing with his story, which means the most to me. I very rarely listen to someone and have such an emotional reaction because of the impact that his story has on my mission to help people be happy. And I wanted to welcome our special guest here at SoFi Stadium, Kevin Hines. Thank you very much, Dave. Nice to meet you. It's incredible to meet you in person. From the day I saw you digitally, uh, you have this book that I had heard of, The Art of Being Broken and How Storytelling Saves Lives. And it seemed a little bit redundant for what I do, right? Everybody's a storytelling coach, whatever. <laughs> it's all about the story. And I coach guys who are storytelling coaches. And I'm thinking, you know what? He has a documentary called Stay Alive. And I'm thinking, yeah, storytelling, blah, blah, blah. I hear so many stories, but I'll never forget your story. Oh, thank you. Man. And the way you told it uh, was also incredible. Um, you had a struggle, and I'd love for you to share that story here on the playbook with me and Absolutely. to help other people as well. Uh, you were in a bad place. I was in a very bad place. Uh, I was 19. I had been diagnosed with bipolar depression at 17. I was spiraling out of control. You, you were adopted originally? I was adopted, uh, born in abject poverty, lived in out of crack motels as an infant, uh, taken away from my birth parents, placed into foster care. Brother died in foster care. We both got bronchitis. He died. Every year I get bronchitis, so it's a reminder of losing my brother. And uh, unlike him, I got lucky. I got taken in by the Heinz family. They made me their son. They gave me the world. And I thought to myself growing up, I got this. I got it made in the shade. How can anything go south from here? But at 17, it all came crumbling down. My brain broke. I had a complete mental breakdown in front of 1,200 people uh, playing a theater show at Archbishop Reardon High School, uh, playing one of the leads. And I had to leave mid-show. The theater director had to come on and play my role. And uh, he was my hero. He was my mentor. He was my friend, John Fennell. He would be the first person of now 18 people that I dearly care about that would die by suicide. And his suicide, in all truth, made my thought of suicide an option because he, he was everything to me. I love the man like a second father figure. And at 19 years of age in September, I really believed I was useless, worthless, and had no value. I thought everybody hated me. I thought my family wanted me gone from this world. And I thought I was their greatest burden. If I had asked them those things, they would have moved heaven and earth to keep me safe for myself that day. And on September 25th, 2000, I went out to the Golden Gate Bridge and I leapt off. But here's the kicker. Upon the millisecond, my hands left the rail. Instantaneous regret for my actions. And but it's went, too late. It's too late. For 99.9% for .9 of people who've done what I did, it's too late. And uh, I fell 75 uh, miles an hour, nearing the speed of terminal velocity, 250 feet, 25 stories in four seconds. And in those four seconds, I prayed to God that I would live. I just said, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. I hit the water. I went down pretty deep. I opened my eyes and I was drowning. I couldn't get back to the surface. And that's when something began circling beneath me. Something very large and very slimy and very alive. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to eat me. Those are great white breeding grounds. I was panicking and I'm taking my one good arm and I'm punching this thing, but it's not going away. It's circling faster and faster, faster and faster. No longer am I waiting or treading in the water. I'm lying atop on my back being kept buoyant by this creature. It turned out to be a sea lion. I affectionately named him Herbert. Herbert saved my life that day. The Coast Guard secondarily saved my life. They were incredible. 
and the uh, at the hospital, one of the foremost back surgeons in the world, performed a surgery on me that had been rarely done before, saving me the ability to stand, walk, and run. So, David, I always say to people, I get to be here. I get to be. It's a gift and it's a privilege. And no matter the pain I might be in, I'm in a lot of pain. I deal with a great deal of physical pain every day. No pity needed. I took that action on myself. I take responsibility for it. But I, I have a lot of brain pain often, but I get through it because I know that I can hold gratitude inside my pain so I can always survive it. You obviously had genetic and energetic inner inheritance that caused trauma that you never dealt with, even though you were given every blessing and the family that you were adopted by, support of that family, love from that family. Yeah. And before you decided to commit suicide, how did faith play a ro role in your decision-making process to end your life? I, I think it's really important to understand that I was uh, born and raised Catholic, uh, believed in God my whole life, on the bridge, that is the only time I lost my faith. Standing on the bridge looking down. My father is fond of saying at baseball games with his buddies, he found him on the way down. I, I did. I found God on the way down. I prayed. And when I came above that, when I, when I was in the water drowning, I prayed. And it was, I always say, David, faith, family, and friends will get me through any hardship. Because my three F's are what I hold dear to me. And, 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 and they're sacred. And they're sacred to me. What God were you praying to when you said you grew up religious? Yeah. What God were you praying to when the struggles had hit when you were 17 and probably experienced, you know, enormous amount of expression of trauma. And then you're, you know, Fennell kills himself. Yeah. You know, what kind of questions were you asking of your God? Because it's, I, I, I've been in places where my basement had a basement. Yeah. And my only solution was there was no God. I wow. remember telling my mom, I was huh. like, are you kidding me? I lost your house. Yeah. I, I, I had over a hundred million dollars. The only reason I wanted to be rich was to buy you a house, six kids you raised. I don't believe in God. Wow. Like what? And she said, oh. You believe in God, you just believe in the wrong God. <laughs> and that's what changed my perspective yeah. and my faith that has gotten me here today, where my office is at a $5.5 .5 billion stadium. And yeah. I, I have everything I ever dreamed of in family, in faith, in finance, in fitness, all my favorite Fs. But I always wonder, like, w because people are struggling right now. Yeah. And they're probably questioning because it's the fastest growing uh cause of death suicide yeah in all demographics yes rich poor tall short doesn't fat matter. skinny it don't matter it doesn't matter what were you what were you doubting in your faith i thought god abandoned me yeah i thought he abandoned me and uh i go back to the old adage it was then i carry you my son he was carrying me in the hardest times of my life but i i forgot i let it go and you know, I, I, I do want to say, I get messages from people that say, you know, why would God save your life, but not the three, 4,000 other people that jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge? I don't have an answer to that question. But I will say this. I have dedicated my life, my wife's life, my friend's lives, my father's life to suicide prevention. And since my attempt off the Golden Gate Bridge... And since my starting of telling my story seven months after, hundreds of thousands of people today have said my story saved their life. So I believe that's why I got to live, so I could make an impact. I made the greatest mistake of my life, but it set me on a path. I don't believe there are failures. I believe they're just setups to something greater. I, I, for my family, though, I sure wish I didn't do what I did. It broke them. I remember my father coming into my hospital room. And there I am in a bracing structure, about to go into surgery. This is a man who never cried. He took a look at me. Waterfalls flowing from his eyes. Toughest SOB I know. 
And he goes, Kevin, I'm sorry. I said, no, dad, I'm sorry. He felt guilt. It had nothing to do with him, you know? And he came over to my left side. He kissed me on the forehead. And, he, and they had given me a 50-50 chance of living through the night. He said, you're going to be okay, I promise. I held on to that promise. I knew I was going to live that night. And I knew I was going to thrive someday. I live with chronic thoughts of suicide. They plague me. They'll never take me. I'll never die with my hands. Every time I'm suicidal, I do two things that I teach to the world. I look in a mirror. I find a mirror anywhere. I say, my thoughts do not have to become my actions. They can simply be my thoughts. They don't have to own, rule, or define whatever I do next. The second thing I do is look to anyone willing to listen. And I say four simple but very effective words. I need help now. That is my shorthand for suicidal thinking. Everybody in my family, all of my friends, my doctors, they know it. I save my own life every time I get to that dark place. And I'll always do that. I'll never go that way. I think it's amazing that you still have those thoughts and that you are vulnerable enough to tell people that it's chronic. It's part of your biochemical and bioanatomical energetic or genetic makeup that causes you to see things differently than I do. Yeah. Right? I was born with a happy gene, right? I probably, my greatest failure is I'm a toptimist. I don't see anything, but the most touching part to me that resonates with me the most, that chokes me up every time I think about it, is that analogously, how much, how many of us are drowning and all we see is a shark or the sharks. That's all we see, we're drowning. Yeah. And all we see is sharks, but with faith, it, it's that shark that turns into a seal. It yeah. turns into a hawk. It turns into <laughs> to a boat. It turns into whatever it is that actually doesn't eat us, but holds us up until we get other people to help us. Yeah. And every day you live with sharks. Right? My, my problem is I live with angels and I think, oh, I'm protected, promoted, and loved by everything and everyone, yeah. which may be almost as dangerous as thinking there's <laughs> sharks that are gonna eat me. <laughs> But we're both held up by the same faith. Yeah. We're both held up by the same faith because when things don't go, the outcomes that we don't understand or know in our lives, yeah. right, we have faith to tell us we're not being punished. No. We're not we're we're not going to be eaten. No. We're being promoted, protected, and loved so that we can empower other people. You know, I just was here earlier in I know you save lives every day. I know people watch that video, even videos that you and I have done, yeah. and it saves lives every day. Yeah. And I know that my own book connected to goodness, yeah. God, greatness, gold, growth, whatever you want to put in that G, people will tell me, you saved my life. Today, yeah. that guy was here and he's like, your book saved my life. And it's the meaning that we give your story that you give my book, these yeah. videos, that are the sharks that will hold us up, but we need to ask for help. We do, we really do. And that, that, that's the biggest message is that when you are in the darkest hour of your life, you have to reach out because not everyone's gonna reach in. You have to open the floodgates and say, I need help now. And the difference between me and people who die by suicide is that I don't stop saying I need help now until someone is willing to empathize with my pain and help keep me here. That's the difference. Is that there's people that will ask once, they don't get the right answer, and they go, they go take their life, they go attempt. But if you just continue to ask to perfect strangers, I've, had, I've been in the Atlanta airport in front of TSA and said, I need help now. They're like, what do you mean, kid? I'm, I'm suicidal. And they're like, well, you need to lock you up in a, in a, in a room and, and call police over and, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, but then they got me to safety. I was safe that day. Yeah. I, I'm here. I get to be with you right now. How incredible is this with your team? This is a gift every you're, moment. Yeah, you're every, the gift. Oh. And 
I know we're going to do so much more. Uh, I know your story needs to be shared with many more people. Uh, even if you're not suicidal, uh, we are all better off when we are brave enough to illuminate. I need help now. Yeah. And it's okay. Not everybody can help us now, but keep on asking because eventually every single day you'll find somebody yeah. and the fastest way to get to where you want to be, which is the lesson that I've learned from this interview is either find someone to help them get to where they want to be that kid at the airport. You don't know what people are thinking or help someone get where they want to be or help and ask for help for someone to get to you where you want to be. If it's, if it's safety, that's fine. If it's to a better business, a better family, a better sports team, three final words here on the playbook. Ask for help. The incredible Kevin Hines. You'll see him a lot more on my content because nobody moves me with a story of faith and humility than Kevin Hines. This is David Meltzer with the playbook.